Good morning, Rittman Grace Brethren Church. How are we today? Good to be here with you. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day as well, I guess, whatever that means. Um, but uh, yeah, great to be here with you. Hope everybody is having a great weekend, enjoying the sun shining and, and whatnot. Uh, my name's Clark. I'm the pastor here. If we haven't met yet, would love to meet you. would love to meet your family after service. So as I always say, uh, feel free to stick around. And if you're a guest with us or visiting, uh, feel free to check out that free gift at the welcome desk. We have uh, been in a series that we started last week called Prodigal, and we're continuing in that series here this morning. Uh, this is a series that's based on Jesus's famous parable. Uh, parable is a little story with a big idea, and this parable is found in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, and it's commonly referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, this is the most famous story told by the most famous storyteller. And in this series, we're really breaking it down into three different parts, taking us all the way up to Easter Sunday. And each week, what we're doing is looking at a different character in this story. And we said we want to examine and we want to meditate on what we see in each character. So if you were here last week, we looked at the younger son and his repentance. And next week, we're going to look at the father and his love. What we want to do this morning today is we're going to look at the story through the eyes of the older son, specifically at the older son's resentment. And so here's the way I'd like to structure our time this morning together. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Uh, but as we dive back into this story, I want us to see three things. I want us to look at the root of resentment, the result of resentment, and then finally, we'll look a little bit at the remedy for resentment. So the root, the result, and the remedy of resentment. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to go ahead and open that up. We're going to be, uh, again, at the, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and I want to show you uh, what I'm talking about with this, these ideas of resentment. If you want to use the Bible that we have in the chairs, in the pews you're sitting in, that's going to be found on page 740, I believe. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you. Quick reminder, as we said last week when we began this new series, uh, we said Jesus is telling a story. It's really important that we remind ourselves that. And as Jesus told this story, he, he said this story in the midst of two different groups of people. On the one hand, you have the tax collectors and the sinners, those who would have thought that they had no chance at all being close to God or being in a relationship with God. They thought to themselves that they were too far gone, most likely. Uh, they were labeled outsiders. These people were marginalized and ostracized from society. There was no way of coming near to God, they probably thought. And so Jesus begins this story, the parable of the prodigal son, and he begins it in a way to really captivate the hearts of those hearers. And he finishes it with this, as we saw last week, this beautiful reunion that takes place with the father and the younger son when the younger son returns. And so you can only imagine at this point, as Jesus is at this point in the story, the tax collectors and the sinners are just smiling and they're just taken back by this story that's being told so far. And now at this point, what we're going to see in the story, Jesus turns and he turns his attention onto the Pharisees and the scribes of Jesus's day. These would have been the religious leaders uh, of Jesus's day, the older brothers, we might call them. And so those people who came uh, to hear Jesus, these Pharisees, these scribes, as they listened to Jesus, they were frustrated with his ministry. They were frustrated with the love that Jesus showed to the sinners, to the tax collectors. And they would draw close to Jesus, but they would draw close with a very critical spirit. To these people to whom Jesus was uh, trying to uh, trying to drive home the main point of this parable, these folks that would come and hear Jesus with a critical spirit, this is who Jesus is really trying to shine the light on at this point. And so we continue in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We're going to be breaking in at verse 25. Here's what it says. Meanwhile, 
The older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed the fattened calf. So here's the point that we're going to be looking at now. I want us to see that the root of resentment is entitlement. The root of resentment is entitlement. Entitlement is envy injected with pride. Entitlement is envy injected with pride. And entitlement says, not only do I desire something, I deserve it. I deserve it. Entitlement sounds like this. After all that I've done, why that person and not me? Sound familiar? Upon hearing that the party was being thrown for his brother and the fattened calf was being served, the older son accuses the father of favoritism, especially in light of his faithfulness over the years. He says, notice, look, As many years as I've served you, I've never disobeyed your commands. Yet you've never given me a young goat to celebrate with, which sounds kind of weird. And we'll talk about how that translates to today. But he says, this son of yours, this son of yours who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He says, not only did I desire the fattened calf, I deserve it far more than he does. In fact, I'm entitled to it. And so because we're reading a story with thousands of years of uh, distance, right? When you read the Bible, a lot of times there's a distance between time and language and culture. And so we see that today. There's a little bit of a cultural gap. And so what I want to do to serve you best is to give you a few categories, a few categories to think through this idea of entitlement. And as we explore these categories, I want us to consider a question. What do you think you are entitled to? What do I think I'm entitled to? Here's the first one, material entitlement. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Um, Some of us feel like we're entitled to have a nice house, perhaps, new cars, all the fancy bells and whistles, comfortable savings account, a secure retirement portfolio, perhaps. And maybe we see others around us getting all kinds of nice trinkets and nice new toys and exploring new vacations and seeing the world differently. And perhaps we're tempted to look, tempted to look at them and go, why them? Why not me? Social media becomes a Rolodex of resentment for some of us. You know, we flip through our phones and we just look and go, oh man, they're going out to that nice restaurant again? Why don't we ever go out? You flip through your social media account, you go, man, they're in the mountains again. We never go to the mountains. Once again, the question we need to ask, what do we think we're entitled to? How about this one? Relational entitlement. Friendships. Think about friendships. We might think to ourselves, why are these people invited and not me? Why does she always get the attention, but they never seem to notice me? Some of us have unspoken expectations of people in our lives, people who want to be in others' friendship circles, perhaps. And when those expectations go unmet, it can breed resentment. What relationships do we feel entitled to? How about this one? Career entitlement. And maybe not everybody's still working, but there's still an implication or application for you in this as well, I believe. We might think to ourselves, I work hard. I hit all the marks. I do all that's asked of me. Yet time and time and again, I keep getting passed up for that promotion. 
all of my work seems to go unnoticed. I deserve recognition. I deserve that job. I deserve that opportunity. I deserve reward. At least far more than that person. What type of achievement, recognition, job do we feel entitled to? Because the root of resentment is entitlement. And an unchecked spirit of entitlement in our hearts will breed resentment. Let's move on to look at the results of resentment. What is the result of resentment? In the older son's reaction to the father, I think we see a number of results of resentment. There's five I want to give us. There's more than five. But these not only stand as a warning of what resentment leads to, but for many of us, these might be symptoms that point to a deeper heart issue. We see uh, two of them in verse 28. Notice, it says this, The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. The first result is anger. And I know we just touched on this in our last series, guilt, fear, shame, and anger. So we're not going to camp out on this for a really long time. But notice, the text says that he became angry. So I think it's worth mentioning where the father responds to the return of the younger son with compassion, the older brother responds with anger. And so we need to see that the resentful older son he has an undercurrent of anger towards life circumstances, as many of us do. They hold grudges long and bitterly. Someone like this is tempted to look down on other people. Uh, they have a deep insecurity that tends to make them oversensitive to criticism and rejection, and yet they're fierce and merciless when it comes to condemning other people. And so those who struggle with resentment expect their goodness to pay off, and it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it results in anger. So if you tend to think that your obedience, if you tend to think that your goodness has entitled you to a good and easy life, you are inevitably going to be an angry person because we all know this. Life is not always good and easy. So the first result of resentment we see in the text is anger. But then secondly, we also see a lack of joy. The text says not only was he angry, but notice also he refused to go back in to the party. He refused to celebrate. He refused to enter in. Why? Because joy and resentment cannot coexist Together In the story, we see the music and the dancing of the party. Instead of inviting and evoking joy in the heart of the older son, it became a cause for an even greater withdrawal. Where there was joy, there could not be resentment. And so the experience of not being able to enter into other people's joy is the experience of a resentful heart. Because resentful people become less free, less spontaneous, less playful. And others come to see them more and more as a heavy person. And I think sometimes we just need to hold up a mirror and ask ourselves, how do we see ourselves? How do others see me? Am I joyful? Am I spontaneous? Am I full of laughter, full of energy? Or am I weighty? Am I frustrated, perhaps even bitter. The third one we see is in verse 29. It's selfishness. Just notice this with me. The older son answers his father and he says, look at this. Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I've never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with, you guessed it, my friends. Resentful people, resentment results in selfishness because resentment rooted in entitlement, once again, as we said, I desire or I deserve. Resentment keeps you at the center. It ends up 
being about what you want, what you desire, what you think that you deserve, and what you think that you've earned. And the older son's selfishness is apparent in the party. If you just picture this story, and you you probably see this a lot with, with younger and little kids, but if you picture the story, there's this epic celebration going on. And the older son's anger and pouting finds a way to make the center of attention, right? The focus has to go to him. The father has to leave the party and go where? To the older son. And my guess is many of us at some point in time in our lives, we've been in that position where there's a great celebration going on. In fact, I'm fearful of this. In in a couple weeks, my daughter's going to be turning one. I'm fearful that someone might be an older son in that situation. I'm not going to say names, though. But there's a great celebration going on, right? There's this great party that's going on. But somebody didn't meet a desire that you had or a demand that you had. And so what you did in the midst of the fun was you got a little bit angry and pouted and waited for somebody to come and kind of give you some attention. Selfishness is the result of resentment. And I think that's true of each and every one of us, myself included, The fourth one we see is dutiful obedience. In verse 29, again, we see his, he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and you've, and I've never disobeyed your orders. I wonder if we caught this the first time, but think about the language that's being used here. He's using servant language. He's not using son language, is he? Not only did the younger son who left his home in pursuit of freedom and happiness get lost, but you know who else got lost? So did the one who stayed home. He lost his identity. Externally on the outside, we talked about this last week, externally on the outside, as you looked at his life, would have looked clean. He did all the things that a good son was supposed to do. He worked hard, took care of all of his responsibilities, fulfilled all of his obligations, but he increasingly became unhappy and unfree. And so he was no longer engaging with the father as a son. He was engaging with the father as a servant. He obeyed the father to get what was due him to get leverage over him, and to position himself so that the father would inevitably owe him. He didn't obey the father in order to resemble him, in order to love him, in order to know him and delight in him. The older son's life was one of duty, not delight. That's why one of the results of resentment is dutiful obedience. It's thinking, I've got to do these things So that I can earn what's owed to me. And isn't it true that for so many of us who lean towards the older brother, isn't it true that your obedience, your duty-filled life, which often you're proud of, for being honest, which often you get praised for, isn't it true that sometimes that feels like a burden? Sometimes it feels like it's a weight that's been laid upon us. The fifth result of resentment is a breakdown of relationships. Now, I think this is very evident in the story, but it's still worth mentioning. The older son publicly offends the father by refusing to go in, by refusing to be a host at the party that he should have played that role as the older brother. Instead, what happens? He offends the father publicly by staying outside, and the father goes out to him. The father pleads with the older son to come back to the party. And the older son talks down to him. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Culturally, it comes across more like this. Look, you. Look, you. There's no honor that's shown to the father. There's no respect that's shown to the father. And you see it in the way, and even in the context in which he addresses him. He calls into question the father's discernment, and he calls into question the father's decision-making. And so we see this breakdown in the relationship with the father, 
But it's not only a breakdown in the relationship with the gift giver, but it's also a breakdown in the relationship to those to whom you're resentful of. And this is true in the way that the older son now relates to the younger son. Notice verse 30. But when this son of yours, did you catch that? When this son of yours, he no longer claims him as his own, right? This son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours. Me and my wife do that sometimes when our kids are being bad. Like, you know what your son did? But you see, there's an alienation. There's a breakdown of relationship that we see here. And don't you know this to be true of yourself? When we resent what other people have, it's really hard to be around them. It's easy to create distance from them. Resentment results in a breakdown in relationships. And I want us to see that there's something different between the younger son's rebellion and the older son's resentment. The results of resentment, or these symptoms of resentful hearts, they're easy to hide, aren't they? The younger son, we talked about last week, the younger son, he couldn't hide his rebellion. Anybody could see that. But what had been experienced in the heart of the older son, that's easy to hide. It's easy to hide that. It's easy to keep that in the dark. It's easy to deny that. It's easy to say that's not there. For those of us who have the tendency to do that, I want to share with you a quote from a book that I quoted from last week. It's from author Henry Nowen in his book, Return of the Prodigal Son. Well, listen to this cautionary warning that he gives. He says this, the lostness of the older son is much harder to identify. After all, he did all of the right things. He was obedient, dutiful, law-abiding, hardworking. Outwardly, the elder son was flawless. But when confronted with the father's joy at the return of the younger son, a dark power erupts in him. And he continues, a dark power erupts in him and boils to the surface. Suddenly there becomes glaringly visible a resentful, proud, unkind, selfish person, one that had remained deeply hidden, even though it had been growing stronger and stronger and more powerful over the years. Here's the point. Hidden resentment that goes unchecked gains strength, it gains power, it gains influence over you while kept in the darkness. Which means this, whether you're experiencing all of the painful ramifications of the result of resentment, or if you're just beginning to experience the mild symptoms of resentment, it's something that needs to be dealt with for the good of you, for the good of your own heart, and ultimately for the glory of God. We must find a remedy for resentment, and I think we see that remedy vividly clear in how the father moves towards the son, how the father moves towards the older son in what he does and what he says. And I think one remedy for resentment is repentance, which we talked about last week. But what I want us to see this morning is that the father came out, the father pleaded with the older son to turn from his resentment and to enter into joy. And he beckoned him to join in on the celebration. And so for the younger son, repentance meant I've got to let go and loosen my grip on the things of this world and I need to turn to the father. For the older son, repentance is a little bit deeper. It looks more like this. I've got to allow my heart to no longer be gripped by some of the things of this world that grab a hold of it. Things such as pride and envy and entitlement and anger and lack of joy and bitterness. There's got to be a turn from those things as well. And that requires deep works of the heart. But once we confess those sins and the ways that they grab a hold of you, once you turn from them, you have to refill with something. And there's two things that needs to be 
filled with. When we look at the way the father speaks to the older son, notice again in verse 31, he says, My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours, verse 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and alive again. He was lost and is found. I think we need to replace resentment with gratitude. We need to replace resentment with gratitude. We see it in the father. I'm sure that as the father looked at his life, this is not the way that he wanted things to go with the younger son. I'm sure he didn't want his younger son to come back beaten, abused, and torn up by the world and empty-handed, right? He probably didn't want that. It would have been easy for him to say, why can't my sons be like that guy's sons? But the father receives his younger son back, and he even says, we had to celebrate. We had to celebrate. He received the younger son as a great gift of love to be celebrated. And so resentment and gratitude, they can't go together either. Resentment clouds our vision. That's what it does. Resentment clouds our vision, causing us to focus on the things that we deserve. And it tends to miss the ways in which we ought to see all of life as a gift. Whoever we are is a gift. Whatever we have is a gift. A gift to receive and a gift to be celebrated. But along with gratitude, we need to replace resentment with trust. We have to re replace resentment with trust. Trust in the fact that the Father wants you home too. As long as you believe that you're less favored by the Father, as long as you think that you're less loved by the Father, as long as you think that you're less loved by God and those around you, you can't be found. The father says to the older son, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. He doesn't address at all the things that the son has done. He doesn't care about the list of things. He simply says, son, you have not been earning anything. You haven't been earning anything from me. All that is mine is yours. You have always been with me. This is yours, and we need to see this as well here this morning. The father doesn't just look out the window for the return of the younger son. He's also looking out the window for the return of the older son. And what does he do when he sees the older son? Does he stop and pause? to hesitate to come in, what does he do? He goes after him. He doesn't just go out to receive the younger son. He goes out to plead with this, the older son to come back, to turn from resentment and to embrace joy and to embrace celebration. So in light of that, in light of all that, it's a, it's, it's a good story what do you do with it? What do you do with a story like this? What do you do with a message like this? Well, for the older sons in the room, which I think we can all identify a little bit with the younger son, God is in pursuit of you too. He is in pursuit of your heart. And he will go to the ends of the earth for you too. He loves you and he longs for you to join in on the celebration. You've always been with him. Everything that he has is yours. The question is, do you trust him? Do you trust what he says? Nowhere in, in this message, nowhere is this message clearer than in the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son. Because see, like the father who was willing to leave this sweet reunion with the younger son, and pursuit of the older son, Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, God the Son, left a perfect heavenly dwelling place, perfect intimacy with the Father. He left that in pursuit of you, in pursuit of me, in pursuit of the younger sons, in pursuit of the older sons. Jesus left the Father 
Jesus entered into the farthest stretches of the world. He entered into humanity to show us the Father's love, a love that comes at a great cost. And we'll talk more about that next week. But what I want us to see this morning is that this is where the story of the prodigal son ends. We don't get a response from the older brother. We get a plead from the father, and then it ends. Why? Because the whole point of this story is to provoke the older brothers, to provoke the older sons, to provoke the religious leaders, to provoke those who struggle with resentment, to provoke those who struggle with entitlement, and to come to the end of themselves, to see who they are, and to see what they rightly deserve, to receive Jesus. The whole point is to leave the older son at a place to respond. So the question for me and you this morning is, how will we respond? Let's pray together. Well, Father, so many of us tend to be mirroring the older son of this story, and we know this is true of us. Father, many of us are feeling conviction this morning, my guess is. And Jesus, you spoke this story to provoke conviction in the areas where we need it most. And so, Father, I just pray that you would convict us of the Father's joy and love. Not just the love shown to the younger son, but the older son, too. And would you help us to respond this morning in worship, not greater frustration. Please guide us into worship. Help us to pursue you, ready to receive your grace and mercy empty-handed. We pray all these things for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name.